Welcome to the Ethan Homestead, folks. I'm John Devino, one of the uh, volunteers here at the Homestead. I see very, uh, several familiar faces in the group. Uh, this happens to be uh, Archaeology Month in Vermont, so this is an appropriate topic to have uh, uh, for today. Uh, Steve Butts is our guest speaker, and Steve is a graduate of Cornell College. He is undergrad and graduate work at Cornell. He is an educator, a writer, an archaeologist, and an environmental scientist, among other things. And uh, he's the co-director of a program called the uh, Shays Rebellion uh, Project, and that's why, the Shays Selman Project, I should say, and that's why we're all here to learn a little bit more about Daniel Shays. All I remember is that he was led a tax revolt in Massachusetts and escaped to Vermont, and by the time we get through today, we will know much more about this. Uh, Steve has uh, conducted summer programs for students in archaeology, and he's been featured on a TV show called History, Where It Happened. And he's the author of the book, Shea Settlement in Vermont, which will be available for purchase afterwards, uh, right outside the door over here. And it says $21.99 on the back, but uh, Steve says $20 will, uh, will make us not have to make a change and uh, hopefully give you a little bit of a break also. So please uh, join me in welcoming Steve Butts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to be here at the Ethan Allen Homestead and I want to thank them for having me come out and talk about this uh, pretty interesting uh, aspect of Vermont history that is just coming to light. And um, as I uh, was mentioned, I apologize, we've got a little kind of a projector zoom problem here, that's as tight as you can get it, so the, the top might be cut off. Um, but I'm here to talk to you about the Shays Settlement Project, which is the first formal uh, scientific and historical investigation of a settlement that was founded by Daniel Shays and his followers shortly after the rebellion that he led in Massachusetts in 1787. Um, amazingly, the site has remained isolated for over 200 years in the Vermont mountains, southern Vermont. Um, uh, in April of 2013 is when the actual formal archaeological and historical investigation began. Uh, and since that time, we've, and I should update this because we've just completed our, our fifth summer archaeology field school, where we've been um, educating students in grades 9 through 12 in field work in archaeology and learning about their local history. Uh, so far, we're up to about 116. Actually, that number's already grown. So we're almost over 120 students have participated in the program. So this is also an important uh, edu educational outreach program as well. Um, and by the way, if you know of any students, it's going to be running again next summer. Um, I'll talk about how to contact as a website, but if you know of anyone who would be interested, you don't have to be from the area, you can go down there and, and participate. So it's a really exciting opportunity for students to, to learn about history and archaeology. Now, even though formally this program or a project began in 2013, for me, it really began back in 1997 when I moved to the Vermont, New York border area in uh, back in Arlington, Vermont, Southern Vermont. And uh, I began my teaching career there. And when I, when I showed up, I wasn't from the area, and so the locals were saying, hey, you know, you know you're know, interested in science and history. Well, we want to take you up to Shays Fort. It's in the mountains. So I was on a snowmobile ride, and I arrived at this place right here that the locals called Shays Fort. And I was like, wait a minute, Shays Fort? You're talking about Daniel Shays, Captain Daniel Shays from Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah, he built the fort here. He built the fort here? This doesn't make any sense. First of all, it's at the top of a mountain, it's in the middle of nowhere, in southern Vermont, you know, far away from Massachusetts, western Mass, where the rebellion took place for the most part. So why would he build a fort here? It didn't make any sense. And I left that day with that thought in my head, like, could this be Shades Fort? So I began to like, oh, there's got to be books on this, there's got to be something. And much to my surprise, there was nothing. I mean, other than local lore saying that that was Shades Fort. So that's really what began the journey for me. And I really didn't have the resources to begin um, a formal study until 2013, and today is what uh, we'll learn about what I, what I revealed. Now, uh, the location of the site is actually in the town of Sandgate, Vermont, which is on the New York uh, Vermont border, uh, down in southern Vermont. Uh, just north of Bennington. Um, this is a picture of it, and we're looking east into the Green Mountains here. This is actually the town of Salem, New York, so it's right on the border. And amazingly enough, the, the settlement is located right here on the south-facing shoulder of what we call Egg Mountain, EGG. And uh, that's a close-up view of it. And even today, this is an extremely remote area. It's amazing to think that, you know, why would anyone want to build a settlement 
in this remote location. And that's why I was kind of surprised that this had anything to do with Shays uh, at all. Um, today, um, this land is part of a 2,300-acre plot that is privately owned. Um, it is um, right now been purchased by the Conservation Fund. It's got cut up there, but um, they are a nonprofit organization that has purchased the 2,300 acres, and they are interested in preserving it and making it a national historic site or maybe a state historic site. So that's great news because over the years, this area has mostly been used for logging and now is being preserved, and they are working with the Shade Settlement Project and are great partners in learning about this history and supporting our public outreach and preserving this site for Vermont's history in perpetuity, which is really awesome news, and that just happened over the past year. Okay, now, um, this is a map of the settlement. So when I started this back in 2013, the fort right here, uh, was you know where it all began, and I thought, okay, well, I'm going to see if I can contact the landowners, tell them that I want to maybe do this investigation. This might have some connection to Daniel Shays. Will they give me uh, um, access to the property? And they were very cool about it. They gave me access, and I started off trying to retrace my steps on that snowmobile ride to locate the fort, and I did. And then I began to radiate outward and doing GPS surveys, and I was just trying to see, well, what was this big stone structure there? Little did I realize that as a result of my work in that spring of 2013, not only did the fort reveal, but an entire 18th century settlement lay up in the forests of Sandgate, which was a complete shock. And actually, well, not to me, but a lot of people in the area were surprised. All this stuff was up there and they had no idea. So before I get to talking about the settlement, I'm going to do a little history lesson on, on Daniel Shades, because it's important to know my original question, and the question still remains today, was that Daniel Shades fort? Did he build a settlement in Sandgate, Vermont? Why would this actually be true? So that's what we're trying to, to answer that question. So you can't answer that question without going back and figuring out who Daniel Shays was. And it's the same for me. When this started for me, I, I remember, oh yeah, he had a rebellion. It was after the revolution. It had something with taxes or debt. But that was all I knew. Um, and uh, what I um, learned through this journey is an amazing story about himself, just the man. Even if he had nothing to do with the rebellion, he was truly a revolutionary uh, hero. He was a captain of the Continental Army. He fought at all the major battles. He was at Bunker Hill. He was at Stony Point. He was at Saratoga. Uh, I mean, he saw a lot of action and led men into battle. And he was uh, very, very important in, in uh, winning our independence. Um, this is the only known likeness from the time period of Daniel Shays that we have. So he was definitely a war hero uh, serving in lots of campaigns. Now, another thing that's important that I learned, and it also kind of gives you an idea of why he was an important figure uh, with this rebellion that came later. Um, he was involved in the Major Andre Benedict Arnold scandal. So if you remember, Benedict Arnold was a famous trader, and he was selling the, the <coughs> lands to West Point to Major John Andre, who was a British spy, and then Andre got caught, and then they tried him uh, as, a, as a spy, and he was going to hang him. Well, George Washington chose Captain Daniel Shays to act as the um, captain of the guard for guarding Andre while he was in prison for his week-long trial that occurred before he was hung. And uh, that's a pretty amazing thing, you know, because that's a, that was a pretty honorable duty um, that uh, he, he bestowed upon the other shape. So it kind of gives you an idea that he had a very high regard within the Continental Army. Um, another thing that's important about his revolutionary career is he helped construct Fort Putnam, which is, this is a shot of Fort Putnam today. It exists on the grounds of West Point on the Hudson River. And uh, so he did have knowledge of fort construction. Um, so that's an important thing, because remember, we're trying to figure out, well, did Daniel Shays build this fort, and if he did, why? So that's a shot of Fort Putnam, which was a part of his life. Now, the post-war debt crisis. Um, there are books, and I could lecture probably for an hour just on what caused Shays Rebellion and what happened. That's not why we're here. We're here to learn about Vermont history. But I will give you a quick overview of what was going on after the war. There was a big debt crisis that was occurring in Western Mass, um, and it actually affected a lot of colonies. Uh, it even affected Vermont, even though it wasn't a state yet. Um, some of the trouble had to do with credit extended to families during the war. All the men were off fighting, so the elderly and children and women were home on the farms trying to keep things together, so they had to get credit so that they could keep the farms running. Um, after the war, because the British lost, they cut off our trade to the West Indies, and a lot of goods shipped down the Connecticut River from Western Mass went to the West Indies, so that trade was cut off, and that had terrible economic uh, results in Massachusetts. 
Most of the veterans that returned home from fighting the war for three or four years, they didn't get paid, so they had no money. And what they were being paid, if they got anything, were worthless debt notes and, and, and currency that had no value. There was also a problem with the Massachusetts Constitution because it had, uh, to be a senator, for example, in Massachusetts, you had to have a certain amount of wealth and property. And so these guys were just fighting against England because they were trying to get their independence so the common man could be equal to everyone. And they were feeling like, wait a minute, Massachusetts is doing the same thing to us that we just experienced from England. So there was a lot of things going on uh, in 1786 and 1787 of, um, uh, that dealt, you know, that was, that was part of this whole debt crisis. And I, it's too bad you can't see the Bible, but the, the, the quote at the time was, a rising aristocracy bent on depriving them of their liberties. So these were men that had just fought in the war, they sacrificed everything, and came home, and they got the shaft. Now part of the deal was also related to debtor's prison. Because at that time, if you couldn't pay your debts, they would take your property, they would throw you in jail. And that's a ridiculous system, because if you're in jail, how can you repay your debt? So they were very angered by this. So what happened was Daniel Shays and many veterans organized, and there was about 1,500 in Western Massachusetts. They called themselves the Regulators. And whenever there was a court session being held in Massachusetts during the years of 1785 and 1786, they would go, or sorry, 1786 and 1787, they would go and shut down the courts. So they'd march into town as a militia, organized army with weapons, and they would step right up on the court, they'd close the doors, and everyone would go home. Now, it was peaceful. There was no shots fired. Just the presence being there kind of broke everything up. Um, and this happened all throughout Massachusetts. Now, obviously, this is not a good thing for the government. They were angered by it. They didn't know exactly how to handle it because, of course, they were, these were veterans. They were armed. Were they going to confront them with the militia? So what happens? Well, at first, like I said, it was peaceful. And, but it was scary because there were a lot of people that were worried that it was going to go to the next level and there was going to be an armed confrontation. So the regulators were trying to pick a leader, a general. So they chose Daniel Shades. But interestingly enough, and it's really interesting that we're here, here on the Ethan Allen homestead, because the first person that they wanted to lead them was Ethan Allen. And in fact, and this is a, a, a quote from, a, and sorry, it's from Ira Allen, his brother. Um, when the insurrection arose in the neighboring states of Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Shea sent Luke Day and Eli Parsons to Ethan Allen, offering him command of the insurgents. They wanted him to lead the rebellion against Massachusetts. They knew he was brave, obviously, his whole Green Mountain Boys and the saga between New York and Vermont, and then he fought in the revolution. So he was the pillar of this perfect person to come in and do it. Daniel Shays didn't want to do it. There's a lot of uh, literature that says in letters saying that he, he didn't want this job. He did not want to be part of it. And so he tried to pass it off to uh, Ethan Allen, but Ethan Allen said, no, I don't, uh, this is not my fight, I'm not going to be part of it. So what happens? Well, eventually, it came to a head in Springfield, uh, Massachusetts, in January of 1787. The regulators, led by Daniel Shades, marched on the Springfield arsenal, and they were there to gather weapons and stores and ammunition because their next goal was to march to Boston and then try to shut down the government. Uh, they were met by a Massachusetts militia, who fired cannons over their heads to warn them and to have them scatter. The regulators kept coming, and then they fired into them. And four regulators were killed, uh, a bunch were wounded, and then they scattered. And that was known as the encounter in Springfield, because it really wasn't a battle. It was one-sided. The only shots that were fired were from the Massachusetts militia. So after that, the regulators broke up and began to flee, because they were wanted. They were wanted men, they were wanted for treason. And the Massachusetts militia was after them. Um, so they split up into two groups. Some went north toward Vermont, northern Massachusetts, and some went west into New York, near Lebanon, New York. Um, and it, this is a brutal winter. This is January, so it was really slow going, and that was really good because it slowed the British, or the, sorry, the uh, uh, Massachusetts militia uh, down and gave time for the regulators to escape. So. What happened was the governor at the time by James, of Massachusetts was named James Bowden, and he um, said, okay, we've got this big problem. We're going to do the Disqualification Act. So anyone who's involved in the rebellion, if you come in, sign your name, this oath of allegiance, then we will forget your crimes. You can go home and we can forget this ever happened. Uh, they had to surrender their weapons. Um, they had to uh, basically not serve as a juror. Uh, they couldn't serve in the militia. They couldn't run a tavern. Uh, and they couldn't teach school for the period of three years, and then they would be pardoned. Now, specifically on the bottom there, it's cut off, but it says that the leaders of the rebellion, 
Daniel Shays, Adam Wheeler, Eli Parsons were specifically named not to be pardoned. They were still wanted for treason and would have been captured would have been hung for their crimes. So, a little timeline that I've put together here, an historical story here. We know that in February 1787, Shays flees Massachusetts. We know there's a report in, a, in the Bennington newspaper at the time, Bennington, Vermont, uh, that in March of 1787, regulator families are seen moving north into Vermont with all their possessions. So this wagon train was moving through Bennington. And that's important because when we get to the archaeology in a minute, that really ties things together. We also know in April of 1787, 100 or more regulators are assembling in Shaftesbury, Vermont, which is just north of Bennington, and they were seeking to live there. They were asking the people of Shaftesbury if we could settle there. The people of Shaftesbury said, you know what, we know what's going on here, and we, we feel bad for you, but we don't want you here because you're wanted for treason. We don't want to be arrested, so just, just move on out. So they moved out. Um, now, the real interesting thing, in August of 1787, Daniel Shays and Adam Wheeler, which are the two leaders of the rebellion who are wanted for treason, are seen leaving a public house in Arlington, Vermont, on horseback, armed with swords and pistols. So they were in Arlington at a public tavern, and that was perfectly acceptable. The most wanted men in America. So that gives you an idea that the Vermonters were really taking their side. And remember, Vermont's not a state yet at this time, uh, so, but it was still run like a state. And they were sympathetic to the plight of Daniel Shays. Now at this point, they were they were known as the Shaysites. So they were the regulators when they were fighting. Now fleeing, they become the Shaysites. Okay, um, this is a portion of a oops. This is a portion of a letter um, written uh, from Ethan Allen to the um, colonel who was in charge of the militia that was trying to uh, capture the regulators. And, um, you know, it's a long thing, you don't have to read it, but basically what it says is that Ethan Allen says, hey, I've heard that these guys are coming into Vermont, and I just want to let you know we're not going to let them do any bad things, you know. But it really wasn't saying, hey, we're going to capture them and return them to you. And in fact, Governor Chittenden at that time, the governor of Vermont, proclaimed that if they would capture them, they would return them to Massachusetts, but that obviously never happened because they were in Arlington. By the way, Governor Chittenden lived in Arlington. So when they were drinking at the town in Arlington, Governor Chittenden lived right there. So he knew that they were gathering there, and obviously Vermont was sympathetic to them, so it's interesting. Uh, in the written word, they were trying to be nice to Massachusetts because they wanted to be the next colony. They wanted to be the fourth or the 14th state. Okay, so how does this all tie to that fort in Sandgate? Well, we know that uh, fellow veterans that lived in Salem and in Sandgate uh, served with Daniel Shays. We know that Daniel Shea's sister lived in Salem, New York, which is right over the border from San Diego. And then, of course, the best thing that I found is the deed to the property. <laughs> so, I mean, it still exists. You can go to the town of San Diego, Vermont, and you can look at this. And you can see it's old, uh, Daniel Shea's deed from David Cowden. So he purchased lots 52 and 56 in San Diego, Vermont, which is about 470 acres, which today the settlement is about what we've identified as the settlement is about 250 acres. So certainly, that land was big enough to house the settlement. So that was an amazing breakthrough. I mean, how could you argue that Daniel Shays didn't own it? Obviously, there's, there's the proof. But that doesn't answer the question about the fort. OK, so here we go, Shays settlement. So there's the fort today uh, in a better shot. If I like the ferns better than the snow, I'll tell you when I'm working up there. Um, and we know that this place was founded in 1787 because that's when they arrived in Sandgate when they were fleeing from the authority. Now, uh, what basically has happened over the past five years, during the summer, we do archaeology up there. During the winter, we do historical research, try and figure out if there's some pieces of evidence we can piece together for this. So I found some things in historical. First of all, um, William Peck was a local guy who lived in New York, right near Salem. And he said when he was a boy, he could look up the Camden Valley toward Egg Mountain and see smoke rising from over 100 cabins. So that's interesting. A hundred cabins. That's a big settlement on Egg Mountain. We haven't found a hundred cabins yet, but that gives you an idea that there was, maybe it wasn't exactly a hundred, but when he was a kid, it looked like there was a lot of people living up there. Uh, I also, oops, I also found this postcard, uh, which is a picture of some ruins, um, and it says Beatty Mountain. Now, Beatty Mountain uh, was what Egg Mountain was also referred to in the past. Today it's Egg Mountain, but it was owned by the Beatty family in the past. And it says, according to tradition, during Shays' Rebellion, um, insurgents lived there, and it showed the settlement was of considerable extent consisting of a fort, a blockhouse, a mill, a tavern, a school, 
surrounded by, or in a village green, surrounded by 15 to 18 houses. So that's a pretty amazing description. Um, another description which I found in the Hemingway History of Vermont, which is like the Bible of Vermont history, I'm sure you've all heard of it. Um, again, it's kind of a similar description. Daniel Shea's founding a settlement that 150 years ago consisted of a tavern, a little store, a fort, a blockhouse, middle dam mill, schoolhouse, burying ground, and 15 to 18 houses around the village green. So two historical references. So that was really fascinating. And it kind of, uh, you know, gave light to the, well, okay, we found this whole settlement up there. It seemed like this wasn't just a place they were hiding out. It seems like they were trying to establish a whole new community to be self-sufficient. Okay, so I'm going to give you a virtual tour of the settlement and discuss the archaeology and how it all kind of pieces the, the, the story together to prove what we, we believe happened. So uh, we started up with the fort here with the study. So the fort is um, a pretty beautiful place. It's right at the top of the mountain. Uh, this is about 2,200 feet above sea level, so it's a pretty extreme environment even today. Uh, the fort consists also of a small building in the center. Actually, I shouldn't say small. It's, it's 47 by 34 feet. We call it the central foundation. We didn't even know it was there until we started cleaning the sites and beginning our archaeological study. Uh, so now we know that the fort is about a 100 by 100 foot very fortified wall with a small building in the center. Um, is that the blockhouse uh, that was referred to in the literature? Um, and uh, it's a pretty interesting place. Now, when you look at the design of the fort, it actually is built like a fort and also positioned in a very nice defensive uh, area, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, another thing I want to talk about that kind of relates to this possibly being a fort, this guy here, Major Royal Tyler, was um, the major that went into Vermont with militia from Massachusetts to try to apprehend Shays. And he worked with Governor Chittenden and said, hey, can we come in here and look for these guys? And they said yes. So he went all through and was trying to capture them. And in fact, in February of 1787, so this is a month after the Springfield encounter, Adam Wheeler was arrested by the Massachusetts militia, but was soon rescued by 40 objects of New York who carried him in triumph to a large mob of rebels. So there was actually a skirmish that occurred somewhere near the Egg Mountain. So the question of, well, why would they build a fort there? Well, probably would have because they were all wanted for treason. They were all military men. So what you're going to do first, you're going to build a defensive position. If you knew that the Massachusetts militia was going to come and get you, and when they captured you, you'd be brought to Boston and hung as a traitor, I think Daniel Shays would have fought that. <coughs> so it kind of makes sense that they built a defensive structure there. Uh, and this is actually from Tyler's own biography. So in his words. So that's kind of an interesting twist. Um, we also have a letter from Ethan Allen to Major Tyler. Okay, so this is another Ethan Allen connection. Uh, and it basically says here that they met and spoke about what, because Ethan Allen, this is an interesting uh, connection to this location because I believe that uh, right around this time, Ethan Allen was moving from southern Vermont up here to the Burlington area, or the Onion River, I guess as it was called back then, maybe. Um, this was right around that time that his, his homestead was being constructed. I believe it was, was it 1787? Yeah. yeah. So this is right in that time. So he writes a letter, and he's telling Major Tyler that um, you know, we know that uh, government of the state have been very, very friendly to yours, and the criminals who have acted against the law and society have come from your state, we send back to you. Others who have only took part with Shays, we govern by our own laws and make sure that they're not gonna go back into Massachusetts and cause trouble. So that was a really interesting thing. So Ethan Allen, even though he didn't wanna head the army, he still basically gave these guys a haven. He knew they were there, because Ira Allen lived in Sunderland, which is right next to Sandgate. I mean, right near Arlington. All these places are totally together. You could not have 200 refugees coming from Massachusetts, building a settlement, and Ethan Allen and Ira Allen not knowing that. It's, it's just, it would be quite unusual. Um, <laughs> now, that was his formal letter, but he was heard, and this <laughs> is uh, what he supposedly said in public, to Major Tyler on the streets of Bennington. Those who held the reins of government in Massachusetts were a pack of damn rascals who have no virtue among them. <laughs> and I do not think it worthwhile to prevent them that had fled into this state for shelter from cutting down our maple trees. So he said that in 1787. 
So I think, and that's what I love as an archaeologist, especially cutting down our maple trees. I mean, why were they cutting down the maple trees? Because they were building a whole new settlement right near Sun River. So another Ethan Allen connection. Okay, so that was the fort. And if you see here, this is the road of the settlement today. It's the same road that started back then in 1787. It still exists as a logging road. Uh, and if you look here, the fort is up at the high ground. Uh, Egg Mountain is right here at the top of the mountain. Um, so this kind of oversees the whole settlement. So it's really an interesting design because if there was the Massachusetts militia coming to get them, they would be coming up the road. So they could actually gather up at the fort and protect themselves. So from a defensive standpoint, uh, it, it works out fairly nicely. Uh, so after the fort, then we're going to go take a look here at what we call the mill complex. So this is the mill complex, which is just over the hill, down the hill from the fort. Uh, it's a, we call it the complex because it consists of different parts. We have the main mill building. We have a thing here we believe is a cistern or a water collection system. Uh, there's a long uh, rectangular building that was built in the side of the hill. We're not sure what that was used for. And then there's a mill pond just up out of the shop. Uh, this is the foundation of the long wall. And this is kind of a map. So we have the, the mill dam, which is there. So the mill pond would have been here. You know, there would have a trough of water that would have powered the mill. It was collected in the cistern and stored. It actually turned the water on and off whenever they needed it. And then this long building might have been for grain storage or lumber storage. Now, uh, when the archaeological field school started in uh, 2014, um, the fort was too wet to dig. So the only site that we really wanted to start at was the mill. So we started our excavations there. And um, since that time, we have educated over 100 students. They come up, uh, they learn about surveying, they learn about digital photography, they learn about excavation, um, artifact conservation. Um, so it's a whole program that is utilizing technology and then of course the old school digging in the dirt to um, teach kids about their own local history. And the work that's been done by these kids has been outstanding. Um, what uh, they have done up there, at first when I was trying to you know, propose this program, I thought, oh, we're gonna bring kids up in the wilderness they're not going to have cell phone service. There's no cell, cell phone service, so their devices don't work up there. They actually have to talk to each other, which is amazing. And I thought they'd get bored real quickly, but they love it. They love digging in the dirt. They love doing all the work. It's pretty exciting to see them in such an active part of their own history. You know? And we've had students from New York, from Vermont, from Massachusetts, and Connecticut participate in this program. Now, this summer was great because we also had the... Um, uh, Vermont state archaeologists come up, uh, Jess Robinson and Yvonne Bast from the state uh, are part of the project now, they are, uh, they're very interested in this. Um, and you know, just recently Jess Robinson is pictured here is saying that this is probably the most significant um, uh, archaeological site in the state of Vermont today. Now, so we get to the archaeology. So there's, you know, you can go all over the place to find stone walls in New England, and you can find cellar walls. But when were they built? Were they built in 1900, 1800? Because if this is Daniel Shays, we know he bought the property, that doesn't mean he lived there. He could have sold it somewhere. And maybe all those structures were built at different times. So archaeology is great because it gives you the physical evidence, the physical proof. So we started excavating at the mill. This is what we started unearthing. So we're trying to prove through you know, the physical evidence of that time period of 1787. Would people have been there in 1787? So these are some of the ceramics that we've unearthed, and these are really easily identified from time periods. In fact, I was looking at your archaeological display out here, and you'll see the time period around 1800. You'll see these exact same things. So the same artifacts that have been dug up from um, Ethan Allen's homestead, they're being used down in Sandgate. Um, lots of tobacco pipes. These, this one too, you'll recognize this. This, this actually is right in that case out there. Uh, it's called polychrome painted pearlware. We have redware, we've got um, uh, specific transferware, and we've identified these patterns specifically. As most of these things have come from Staffordshire, England, so they're English ceramics that were uh, used widely in the colonies, uh, brought from families from Massachusetts. And so that newspaper account of people moving through Bennington with their belongings is substantiated by the archaeology. Um, and you can find these patterns, you know, mosaics, so that's how we know these are mostly from Staffordshire, England. Ironware, uh, this is a hoe for agriculture, there's sheep shears, we've got the Dutch ovens, there's knives and uh, all kinds of, this is an ax. Um, and we started to realize that we're finding things that, you know, of course they've been in the ground for over 200 years so they look corroded, but really they weren't broken. 
Like, for example, this axe. I mean, it, sure, it looks in bad shape, but it, it was discarded perfectly fine. Like, it's not broken, or the, the hull is not broken. So we're trying to figure out, well, why were these things thrown away when they're perfectly usable? You know, it's a perfect, I mean, in 1787, if you're in the wilderness of Vermont, to throw your axe away would be crazy. You wouldn't do it. You'd repair it until it broke in half. Uh, other things we found at the mill, bone handled utensils, pewter, a key. Um, this is a bone handled brush. We found some coins and buttons. But this was really an exciting find. Anyone guess what that might be? pair of glasses. Oh, Unbelievable. Yeah, 18th century reading glasses, most likely. Uh, just incredible. And students found that. Uh, it, also, it also shows the importance of screening, because what we do is, of course, you take the trowel and the dustpan, and you look for stuff, and you try to poke through the soil and identify it. And if you don't identify it, you take what's in your pan, and you put it in a bucket. Take the bucket, you go to the screening station, and screen it again. Well, those were found in the screening station. So it just shows the importance of being a formal archaeologist and doing the right stuff because you really want to, I mean, that's an incredible find. We also found this coin. It's hard to see here, but we identified it as a copper coin from Connecticut, and it was actually dated 1787, stamped 1787. So we're trying to prove if people lived there in 1787. Well, that doesn't prove it, but it's certainly an interesting find. Um, Horseshoes, ox shoes, chains, all this was another intriguing thing. That is a horse bit. Perfectly usable. It came out of the ground still, you could use it today if you cleaned it off. So why did they throw that away? So that was the question that we kept on coming up against and it was, it was very interesting. Uh, the other thing, animal teeth, uh, and this was a real shocker, window glass. So at first, would have thought, okay, they are up here and they're hiding out from the British or from the Massachusetts militia, and uh, why they built some cabins and shelters and then left after a couple months. But it seems now it's quite clear that that wasn't their their uh, intention. They they were putting windows in their buildings. Now that is a big deal. Just getting the windows, where did the glass come from? How did they pay for it? You know, uh, so that was a real intriguing find. Nails. Now I show nails, and then you know, this is boring, but it's important because well, the next thing I'm going to talk about is that evidence that we have found that all of the sites were burnt to the ground. So they were burned purposely. Um, so of course, back then in the 1780s and the early 1800s, a lot of people would burn down an old cabin, collect all the nails and hardware, and use it again because why not? It was perfectly good. So when we began finding evidence of burning, we thought, oh, let's try that. But we're finding all the nails. So they burnt these cabins. Someone burnt them down, these homes. But we're not gathering the hardware. So that was another interesting discovery. Um, here's some other things. And this I showed this because this is from last summer. Um, we uh, found some freshwater mussels, which is really interesting, a part of their diet. We're trying to figure out what they ate up there. And at that time, and these mussels are like large clam-sized mussels, and they were growing in the rivers and the creeks of the Vermont mountains. So definitely part of their diet, which is fascinating. Uh, we also found this. This is the wolf claws. So they were shooting wolves, either for fun or for fur or just to protect themselves. I don't know. That was pretty fascinating. But you can see these continual patterns. Now, keep those patterns in mind because as we move to another site, we're going to see if they're correlated. Now, this was an interesting find. It's a very large, close-up view of what we call a copper dandy button. So this was a big copper button, shiny button, that wealthy people wore on their coats in the 18th century. Now, uh, what's interesting is it has a hole drilled in it. So someone was using it as a necklace or a jewelry. So I don't know if I want to know the story of how a wealthy person's button became someone else's jewelry, but <laughs> maybe it was from the war. I don't know, but that was really kind of interesting that we found that up there. And remember, this is all from the mill site. And then we began unearthing evidence of burning. So these are burnt timbers. There's charcoal evidence all over. So we know that that structure, the mill structure, was burned to the ground. OK, so that's all from the mill complex. Now, if we go down the road, we have a site called the tavern. So this is the tavern. Um, it is a, you know, about a 30 by 30 building. It had one large uh, side fieldstone uh, chimney. Um, all of this, the foundations and chimneys up there were dry laid stone from the, the native Taconic rock. Uh, it had a very large root cellar. Um, it also has either, we believe this is a privy 
oral well. We think it's a privy because there's a creek not too far, so it doesn't make sense that they would have put a well there, but we still don't know. Uh, we're still excavating it. Uh, it is quite deep. It's amazing what people did in 1780s. When you dig a hole, like, I, if you told me to go up to Egg Mountain and dig a 15-foot hole that was, you know, like, even 10 feet wide, uh, the, the work that these people did is amazing. So we're still trying to figure out what this is, and we built a structure to protect it so that we can continue our work, in, because the bottom of a privy is an excellent place for archaeological uh, remains. Uh, so when we, we started excavating at the tavern site, of course, we wanted, you know, who knows if that was occupied at the same time. So we haven't done much, much excavation there, but you see this redware pan, these uh, ceramics, it's that polychrome, okay? So very similar to the artifacts we found at the mill. So we know that whoever lived at the tavern lived at the same time period as the mill, which would be that 1787, uh, and we'll get into later dates uh, as they go on. We also found this. This is a bronze chromal bell, uh, which is a very large jingle bell, essentially, uh, 18th century for sure. Um, uh, so who knows if it was tied on an animal, uh, or if it was used for a sleigh, uh, but uh, that was a pretty, pretty unique find. Okay, now, this map, it's hard to see, but I found this in the Bennington Museum's archives. It's a photocopy of a topographic map, and it's made, it was made in 1976 by a guy who, but I actually know him, uh, he, his name is Doc Maxwell, he was a veterinarian and outdoorsman who lived in the Salem area, Arlington area, and um, he, put this map in a letter, and there's Egg Mountain. He highlighted the road, so he highlighted the road of the settlement. Uh, he marks the fort location with an X, and then right here he says schoolhouse. So, and that's the exact location of where the tavern is. So now, why he says that's a schoolhouse, I don't know. What knowledge, he's long gone now, unfortunately. But it's interesting to see that he obviously has some information to refer to that as a schoolhouse. We call it the tavern because it's kind of the middle part of the settlement, and like that might be the area where the village green was. Uh, so either the tavern the schoolhouse or maybe we haven't found the schoolhouse yet. So that's kind of an interesting aside. So that's all there at the tavern. Now, as we move down the road, we come to the next site, which we call the center chimney house. And this is a beautiful structure, very large house with a very large center chimney. We believe this is the actual doorstep is still there. You step into the house, there was a small root cellar. And you can see the house is pretty large, about 40 feet. Uh, long. Um, of course, you know, again, we had to correlate these sites using archaeology, so we started doing excavations there, and here's what we've been finding. So you can see these patterns here, the same transfer wear, the green edge plates, window glass, another very interesting thing, uh, that building had the windows, pipe stems, buckles, this is actually a reaping knife. So obviously the center chimney house was occupied at the same time as the tavern, and the mill. We also found this last summer of 2017. This actually is a military button from the New York State Militia from during the War of 1812. So whoever lived at this house lived there until at least 1812 and participated as a militiaman. Even though it was Sandgate, Vermont, they obviously joined the militia in New York State. And that's pretty interesting. So that's the center chimney house. Um, by the way, this brook here is called Brown Brook. Uh, on old maps and in old deeds of land records, uh, this is referred to as Widow Brown Brook. So I believe that the Brown family probably lived in the center chimney house. And I'll talk about land records and things later, but we might, this might be the only site that we definitively know is connected to a family. Um, and, and that's interesting because there's a lot of genealogy, uh, genealogy that can be done um, with this too, and we're just starting that as part of the project. Uh, oh, so, down from the center chimney house right here is Foundation 4, which is down Brown Brook. Uh, this, we don't know what it was. It, there's no chimney pile. Um, it's kind of maybe a big root cellar. Uh, it's dug into the ground. It was definitely a foundation. It had a side entrance tunnel. We haven't done much uh, excavation there. The only things we've found so far have been these big spikes and then a little metal buckle. So we're still not sure how that building is used. Um, and then from Foundation 4, we go over to Foundation 2. Foundation 2 is a smaller house built around the creek, a cellar, a large chimney. This is a better shot of it. So you can see this would be the chimney pile. This was the cellar. A huge pile. This is a, the way they constructed things up there is interesting. They put a huge abutment between the creek and the house. So it's really right next to the creek. 
Excavations there, which actually for the first time we excavated there last year. Again, window glass, same ceramics. Okay, so obviously all of these sites are connected historically. Uh, some brass buttons, redware, shell edge plates. Then uh, next to foundation two is foundation three. So it looks like it had a side entrance into its root cellar, a very large chimney. That's kind of a better shot. This is an interesting site because you can actually see that the chimney collapsed in one event. It just, boom, fell right over. By the way, at all these sites, center chimney, foundations two, three, and four, we find charcoal so, and evidence of burning, burnt ceramics and actual burnt timbers. So all of these sites were burned for whatever reason. So we started excavating there, and this is what we unearthed. So again, these same patterns, uh, we call this canary ware, we've got the transfer ware, windows, so every building had windows, which is really amazing. Uh, pipe stems, pewter spoon, um, some nails. This was from last summer, actually. Uh, this was a cool thing. Does anyone know what that is? Spyglass windows, you know the big lump of glass on the window? Yeah, pretty cool. Uh, and this was one of the best pipe bowls that we found, for sure. So, and I saw a couple of those hanging on the wall, actually, outside. And then we found this. This is a hoe for, you know, hoeing the garden in the weeds. Notice, it's perfectly usable. Yes, of course, it's rusted. It's been in the ground for 200 years, but it's not broken. So it was discarded, perfectly usable. And then, like I said, you wouldn't do that in 1787. You wouldn't throw your agricultural implements away. So why is that? Why are they throwing their stuff away? Why was everything burned? <laughs> Okay, now, up until that point, this was about 27, or 2015, I thought we had found all we had found. That was it, you know, which was pretty extensive as is. Like, oh, this is Shea Settlement, a pretty amazing place. We got a lot of work to do here. You get to see that this would be years in the making, going to future uh, dates. I mean, we're just scratching the surface. And then I got a phone call. Um, because by that time, we had done a couple camps, and it was in the newspaper, and people were wondering, hey, what's going on with that? Or, you know, we want to know what's going on up there. Um, I haven't written a book yet or anything. So I got a call and he said, yeah, we know what you're doing up there. And uh, first of all, you're all going to die of the plague. <laughs> and I was like, okay, um, all right, well, well, we're okay. We've been up there a couple of years. Uh, so yeah, everyone was killed by the plague. Secondly, you're not even near Daniel Shea's house. Where you're digging, you're not near Daniel Shea's house. And I was like, whoa, you know where Daniel Shea's house was? Really? He goes, oh, yeah, where you're excavating, not even near well, I said, well, let's go. We we'll jump in the Jeep. We'll go up there. You show me what you know. He's like, you know what? I don't, I, I'm tired. I, I don't want to get involved. Click. Hangs up the phone. So I kind of had an idea of who it was. Because after that, I said, oh, this guy is an old guy from here. And he's like kind of you know, angry. But um, So I thought I must have missed something. So I went back in the woods that following spring. And I started, you know, I've been everywhere up here. Well, let's go down here. So I started uh, exploring this because the road that we come into to do our work today is this road. But there was an older road here. So I found some stone walls, started mapping them, and boom, two more foundations. And foundation five turned out to be the best find of the whole settlement so far. This is what it looked like when we first came upon it. After some cleaning, the chimney is still intact. So the hearth, the main hearth of the house is still there. Uh, which is incredible. It is the largest house for sure. It has a very, very well built cellar. It's got a beautiful hearth. Um, and, well, I shouldn't spoil the surprise, but you can't see it from here. It, it had a back room. There's also outbuildings. So whoever lived here obviously had the nicest house out of the settlement. Now, this didn't mean, because it was kind of far from all the other houses. So we weren't sure if it was built later. I mean, maybe this was after Shays had left. So that's where archaeology comes into play. And when we started excavating there, lo and behold, we're finding the exact same ceramics from the same time period. So whoever lived here obviously was part of the settlement at the same time. Now, was that Daniel Shays? We don't know. Local lore seems to suggest that. But there is no definitive proof that this was his house. Although the person that lived here had the nicest stuff of all. <laughs> and you can see it yourselves. You've seen all the artifacts. This person had the nicest pipes. Also, this person had ivory handled utensils. So everyone else had bone handled utensils. So this was ivory handled. So that was interesting. Um, we found really intricate bone handled, uh, not just knives, but we don't even know what this was from. It was a very large butcher knife. 
Um, lots of buttons. This is actually a, a gilded gold button, so it actually was gilded in gold, so that was a pretty high-end buy. Uh, bottle, glass, etc. Um, this is, from what I understand, and maybe I've, you've got some experts out here that know more about shoe buckles than I, but from what I understand that this type of shoe buckle is a British type, that the continental shoe buckles were more rectangular and the oval shape were British. So someone had a British pair of shoes here. Where they got them, I don't know. I mean, unfortunate British soldier maybe. Uh, but then of course we found this. Now, it's hard to see what it is, but believe it or not, it's a Spanish silver dollar. And uh, it also has a hole in it, just like that dandy button. So someone was wearing it possibly as a necklace, or maybe it was sewed into their clothes to keep the money from falling out of their pocket, although that didn't work because we found it, so it obviously fell out of the pocket. The other thing is, though, it's dated 1776. So I think that that was some keepsake from a Revolutionary War soldier. You know, you got a silver dollar, 1776, you're wearing it as a necklace, you know, you fought in the war. So there is circumstantial evidence to point to the fact that this might be Daniel Shea's house. Window glass. Um, lots of ox shoes and horseshoes. We also found this stone in the base of the hearth. Now this is still a mystery. It's a partially polished stone. Uh, it's not native rock. We believe it's uh, igneous. It might be what we call like a gabbro or possibly basalt. And it was in the base of the chimney. So when they built the chimney, they had this stone at the bottom. So we're not sure if it's significant for some reason. Was it connected to something? Is it from, I don't know. We, the, the question is really hard to answer why that stone was put in the base of the chimney or the heart. Lots of agricultural implements, cookware, this is an old pitchfork, all from the period of 1780 to around 1810. Uh, and then we unearthed this. Uh, right next door, there's a little building right next to Foundation 5. Does anyone know what that is? Limestone, I heard it. Excellent. Oh, can you actually see it? Okay. Yeah, it's a limestone. Uh, this was great because students were excavating and they're like, wait, they see the, the groove and we're putting water on it. We're opening up, like, oh, this is a sacrificial stone. And they're doing rituals in the blood. And I was like, no, 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 this is a limestone. So basically, a limestone was you put a barrel on this thing, you put wood ash in it, you percolate water through it. That would scrub out the sodium hydroxide, which is lye, which is used for making soap and other things. And it was so caustic that you had to you know, gather it on rock and ceramics because it would decay and, 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 and break everything down. So that was a pretty amazing find. So whoever lived here was a major player in the cellar. Um, now this summer was interesting because uh, right down at the base of Foundation 5, a huge old oak tree got blown over by the wind and exposed a massive root ball. And so we had a chance, this was just from this summer, to do some uh, vertical archaeology. So we were like, hey, let, let's excavate the root ball. You don't have to be on your hands and knees all the time. You can actually excavate uh, standing up. So we had to work with Jess Robinson from the state uh, of Vermont. He's a state archaeologist. Um, and he came out, and we, we did some really unique excavations. Believe it or not, we were finding things in the root ball. So uh, pretty exciting. And uh, so this is some of the stuff that we unearthed just this summer. And you can see that the, the patterns are quite clear. Uh, this is all um, you know, period pieces from that time period of 1780s to you know, uh, 1815 ish. So that's some of the stuff we just unearthed this summer. From the root ball, who'd have thought? <laughs> all right, now across the road from Foundation 5 is Foundation 6. Now, this is a small, might have been a root cellar or a storage shed. We haven't excavated there yet, but that was another structure that we found. Okay. Now, the last thing that is one of the sites is what we believe is one of the burying grounds. Uh, there was a lot of local lore that a plague wiped out the Shazites that lived on Egg Mountain. Uh, we know that a series of plagues went through. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but this is the only definitive grave that we found. We think it's a mass burial that probably was done in 1798 when the plague wiped out about 30 children that lived up in the settlement. Uh, those are from the records of a, a church in Sandgate. Um, and it is a massive pile of rock, and it has one standing stone as a marker. There's no names or anything associated with it or inscriptions, but um, that is one grave site there. We believe that there are two others that we haven't really, we have some idea where they exist, um, but we haven't really investigated that at this point. And pretty much that's a tour of the settlement. Now, um, what's the story? Well. We know that 
Shays bought the land and began to live there and built this settlement in 1787. We know that in February of 1788, Daniel Shays and Eli Parsons, so remember, uh, Eli Parsons was the guy that went to try to recruit Ethan Allen, by the way, and he was one of the wanted men. So they write a petition for pardon, because everyone else was pardoned by Governor Bowie by signing that oath of allegiance. But the four remaining guys were still wanted. So they wrote a petition for pardon. And in June of 1788, the pardon is accepted by the Massachusetts House and Senate, so they gave it, they gave it up. And it's an interesting story because what really happened, Governor Bowdoin got voted out of office by the new governor of Massachusetts, John Hancock, right? famous patriot. So I think John Hancock basically said, you know what, let's just let these guys go. This is, this is a terrible situation. So they get pardoned. Now, uh, and this is actually, the, the petition is still here in the, in the uh, archives in Boston, so it's amazing these documents still exist, signed by Shays and Parsons. This was written somewhere in Egg Mountain in one of those homes. Um, and what's really fascinating about this is we think we know when they found out they were pardoned, because in 1788, Daniel Hayes, with an H, sells the land on Egg Mountain to John Beth. And then in November of 1788, Daniel Shays sells the same exact land to John Beck. So it's like, and it took me forever. I was in this kind of sand gate saying, why are there two Ds? This doesn't make any sense. And then I realized, oh, it's an H, not an S. This is ridiculous. What's also strange, we know Shays lived in the settlement until 1790 when he moved to Arlington. So why would he be selling the land that he's living on? So I think this explains why there are windows there, how they got the money to build the settlement, that this character, John Bay, is their secret benefactor. Now, originally I thought that John Bay was just a guy who lived in the area and bought the land. But, and here's a picture of the actual deeds, which is pretty amazing, look at that. H, capital H, small h, A-Y-S. So if you're trying to hide your name, that's not a good way to do it. And then later, Daniel Shays. So Daniel Hayes, Daniel Shays. It's just pretty fascinating. So I think, that he found out that he was a free man sometime between November and September of 1788. Uh, but who is John Bay? That's the other question. Well, when I started investigating John Bay, I thought he was just a local guy, but there was no John Bay from the area. Find, come to find out, John Bay was a lawyer from Claverack, New York, which is just over the border from Western Massachusetts, by the way. He attended Princeton University. He was. In 1788, he was part of the New York State Assembly. He was an assemblyman in New York, buying land for the most wanted man in the country. Uh, he was a member of the Electoral College later in life, so he was highly respected. He trained Martin Van Buren, Ambrose Spencer. He was on the Committee of Safety. But here's the key. He was a strong anti-federalist who was against the idea of a centralized government ruled by the, el uh, of the wealthy elite. So I think that he was the benefactor to Daniel Shays and the Shazites, and gave them the money to build their haven in Sandgate to protect themselves from uh, being hung. And to prove this, I thought, okay, the last thing I could think, well, maybe he was a speculator. You know, maybe he was just buying the property to make money. You know, he's a lawyer, you want to make money? Well, he purchased the settlement for 85 pounds, sold it two years later. Guess about how much? 85 pounds. <laughs> he didn't make any money on it. So that's a really interesting part of the story that was revealed in the historical research and how John Bay might have really played a role in uh, helping the Shazites start a new life in Vermont. Um, now, how did the settlement end? Well, we believe, and it's hard to apologize for this being cut off here, uh, 1813 is when we think that the uh, settlement was abandoned. We know, like I mentioned, in 1798 that 32 people died, if you think of typhus or dys dysentery, 30 of which were children, unfortunately. Then we know in 1813, the Black Death struck through the area. Now, they called it the plague, but it certainly wasn't the plague. And then I just unearthed this letter this past spring, actually, which is pretty amazing. Uh, it's written from Enoch Bassett, who lived in Salem, New York. And it says, it's a very dying time in Rupert and Sandgate, Rupert, Vermont, which is right next to Sandgate, and all about Mr. Chilean Merrills, Mr. James Knapp, and Mr. Salmon Brown, all neighbors on the mountain in Sandgate, to die in within a few days of each other. Now, this letter is more detailed. It talks about well, this guy, Enoch Bassett, went up to visit friends uh, at the settlement. They call it the village on the mountain. And he actually contracted whatever was going through. And uh, so this was really fascinating because it gives us a date of when we knew these people died, not to mention land records that are associated with these names. We also think that that's probably what explains all of the burning, the burnt timbers, the burnt ceramics. The, this is actually a nail in burnt wood that, the, that the, the epidemic wiped them out. 
and someone from either Rupert or Salem or Sandgate went up there and torched the village. You know, they burned it to the ground because it was cursed. You know, these were criminals, they were, they were treasonous, now they got the plague, this is probably, you know, a godless place, let's burn it to the ground, and no one lived there. That's what's amazing. That's how we have all of this left over, because for 200 years, it was still off limits. No one had lived up there since that time, so it's pretty fascinating. Now, with archaeology, we can do a mean ceramic date study, where we um, basically do statistical analysis on all the ceramics. And what this revealed is that the peak occupation was around 1804. So the Shazites started the settlement in 1787, but we know that at least they lived there until about 1813, and its peak occupation, its highest point of population, was around 1804. So they were there quite a long time. And it makes sense, because they built the whole New England settlement. Um, names associated with settlement, because I know, like I mentioned, genealogy. And these are the names that we know of specific people that lived there. Uh, Daniel Shakes, Adam Wheeler, and they're from Massachusetts. Eli Parsons, Simeon Hazeltine. By the way, I just was contacted just yesterday by someone who said, I know a guy who's named Hazeltine. He's a professor at Brown University, and he thinks he has a relative that might have had something to do with Shane's Rebellion. And I was like, Whoa, I gotta get in touch with him because I know exactly where he lived and where he died. I know his grave and it's pretty amazing. So the Hazeltines still are around. Sergeant John Wilson, which was, we think was a British deserter, which is interesting. So these guys all lived there to 1790 and then they left. Uh, but we know that Nehemiah Hewlett and William Harkness lived there to around 1794. And these guys were also regulators. Then we have the Merrills family. Remember, Chilean Merrills died in that 1813 plague, and he had his, his family was there. And the, the date of 1824 doesn't make sense for when it was abandoned, but we know that they picked the land up from 1794. We don't know if they were living there as regulators the whole time and then just took over the property legally. And then this was great, Salmon and Lois Brown. Uh, we know that Salmon Brown died in 1813, and that's why we think that Salmon Brown was the guy who lost his button from the uh, War of 1812, and his widow lived there until she left. We know that they raised three daughters in that house, which we believe was the center chimney house, which is pretty amazing, and she did live to old age. And then we have this unknown person, possibly from Connecticut, James Knapp, who also died in 1813 during that plague that ultimately wiped out the summer. And the ceramics really line up perfectly with this because that date range of 1787 to around 1813 seems to be when those were in use. Now, the last thing I want to talk about when we're into the mountain is the name, uh, Egg Mountain, E-G-G. -G. If you look at the mountain, it looks nothing like an egg. So I found this, uh, in my research, I found this lithograph uh, of the town of Salem, New York, and this is the blow up of it, and it's looking east toward Vermont. And it's labeling the mountains, Mount Equinox, Mount Ager. Mount Ager, wait a minute, that's a mountain, that's where it is. So it's labeled Mount Ager. So where did that name come from? Well, if the term plague comes from A, or they used to actually say Agu, which is the malaria or illness involving fever or a fever shivering fit. So it makes sense that it was Ag Mountain, Plague Mountain, because they thought they all died of the plague. And now that has been turned over to Egg Mountain. So that's kind of an interesting uh, conclusion that was drawn from the discovery of this map. Okay, so we return to the fort. And the question that I asked at the start of this whole thing was, was this Shays fort? And the answer is, I think it was. We know that Shays lived there. We know that he was a wanted man. He was a military man. Remember, he watched Major Andre hung for his crimes as a spy. He saw what it was to be hung. He didn't want to be hung. He would have fought to the death, and he would have defended himself with the fort. Um, like I said, if the fort is defensively positioned perfectly, if this is Daniel Shea's house, which we have, you know, circumstantial evidence supports to it, the, this is the closest house to Salem, his sister lived in Salem, this is the road that would connect you to civilization. So if the, if the militia was coming up, he would be like the Paul Revere. He could ride through the settlement, warn everybody, they could collect up at the fort and defend themselves. And I think that maybe that was built as a defensive structure. Um, one thing I'll close with is Shays, that says Shays in the Constitution. A lot of people think that Shays' rebellion had an impact on the Constitution. I believe there's a different connection, and it's related to that famous president, Millard Fillmore. We all know his history, right? Well, I, <laughs> I didn't. He's, I, Millard Fillmore, what did he do? I have no idea. Well, now I respect this guy greatly. 
Because after Shays leaves, 17, in 1790, he leaves Egg Mountain, he moves to Arlington to Vermont for a bit, then he moves into central New York where his daughter is living, in Kinesis, New York. Uh, when he goes there, he meets a young guy by the name of Millard Fillmore. So it's this preteen who lives in the same town in Kinesis. That's where Millard Fillmore's from. So Millard Fillmore, who's a bright kid, is like, you're Daniel Shays? Oh my god, tell me about the war, tell me about your rebellion, I want to know about your life. So they work together in a factory, believe it or not. <coughs> and then what does Fillmore do? He goes on to become a lawyer and then a legislator. And his, his big act of claim to fame was legislation, an act to abolish imprisonment for debt, which was signed into New York State law in 1831. It was the first law in the books that eradicated debtors' prison. And I think that that was the influence of Daniel Shakes, telling him his whole story, his whole plight. And it changed American law eventually because, of course, that became law for the country. And then he becomes president in 1850. By the way, uh, the Fillmore family came from Bennington. So they are, they are Vermonters, actually. So uh, interesting connection there. And Daniel Shays lived until being an old man. He died in Kinesis, 1825. That's his grave. He certainly was a Revolutionary War hero. So future goals for this project. Uh, we're continuing our education program, our excavations, and the historical study on this very unique part of Vermont's history. Uh, we're working on long-term site preservation, whether that be state, national. Uh, we are definitely preserving it. The landowners are 100% committed to um, preserving it. And we're hoping that these artifacts and the story of this place can be you know, put in a museum or maybe a number of museums uh, in Vermont um, to tell this very unique story. Um, and I know I've been talking a long time and quickly, probably. Uh, but if you want to know the real story, you can buy my book. Um, it tells you really detailed. I mean, I'm kind of rushing through this, but there's a lot of detailed information about the project and how things have gone and the history, uh, Shays Rebellion, and, and everything that we found up there. Uh, there's also a website. It's cut off, but it's shayssettlement.org, and you can look it up on Google. Lots of information about the site. Actually, we're working on a um, virtual map of the settlement right now. So students have been doing 360 degree panorama photography. So we're, we're going to have like this interactive map on the website. You can click on Foundation 5 and you can actually view it. And there's going to be artifacts there. We're working on maybe making some 3D scans of the artifacts for educational study and, and uh, academic study. So um, you know, uh, if you're interested, there's a Facebook page and then a website to tell you about things that are going on with the project. And I thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Were any of the people from the settlement recorded in, in the U.S. Census records? No, not when they were in the settlement. Because it would have been three years. Exactly. So 1790 was the first one that, she, or the, the, that they said who was living there in 1790. And they, but the settlement was not included in that record. Yeah, which is pretty interesting. And there's no maps of it. There's no, it's not mentioned anywhere. I mean, it was in the town of Sandgate, but it's not. <coughs> yes, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yes? Where is the, you buried again in New York, but what city? Uh, Kinesis? Kinesis? Yeah, I believe it's Kinesis, New York. The Union Cemetery, um, I believe it's called, yeah, in Kinesis. Yes? Um, maybe you said this and I missed it, but um, in terms of the, the Slave-like illnesses that right. wiped out so many. Okay, so it was just contained through that settlement, and none of the surrounding towns. No, it was all within the area. It yeah. Did spread. Yes, it was through. Yeah, Sandgate, Rupert, Salem. It was kind of a yeah, it swept through. But they were blaming that settlement for the origins of it. That's the question we don't know. If it, they think that it came out of there, or it hit hardest there which maybe was the case because it was a very harsh area where they lived. I, you know, with the factors that involved, but why they burned it down, maybe they thought that it was because of the whole history of the place. Yeah, but that's still up in the air. They might have burned it down to, to contain the contagion, but they Could be, yes. And it does explain why we find all these things intact there, that they didn't remove stuff from the cabins so the houses. They burned it down with it in there, which is pretty amazing. So it was definitely a... A rash act. Yes. Ethan Allen was um, 
I think he was general of the army or militia of Vermont, but that was it, right? Mm -hmm. He came back from saw Washington, and then he came back and he brought in the other Oh, oh, good. Yeah. Now, I do know one thing that actually, and they call it the Onion River, but uh, there was two regulators that were up here at the Onion River, and they were actually captured by the locals in Vermont at that time. It was 1787, during when all this stuff was going down, and they were moving into the settlement and building it. And they were returned to Bennington and then returned to Massachusetts. So Vermont, that was the only evidence of Vermonters actually with guns and saying, let's go, we're going to bring you back. But everyone else was pretty much let go. Yes. Do you have an idea of the sort of economic uh, activity in the settlement? How they live? Right. They sell stuff? That's a great question because if you look at the life that they were living, that was equal to anyone who was living in right. any New England settlement right. at that time. I mean, they had everything. They had glass windows. They had nice um, plateware. Uh, so where did they get their funding? They obviously were milling and farming up there, so they were trying to be self-sufficient. But it was they were certainly trading with their neighbors. I mean, everyone in that area knew they were there. Um, so yeah, they were just part of the, that local economy, which is fascinating. Although I do think John Day had some input of money, because they couldn't have done this with no funding. There's no way they would have been able to do it. Yes? Do you um, think eventually you will test for the <laughs> That's what the students ask me, like, let's dig up a body. Um, it's funny, uh, that would be way over my pay grade, but now that we have, you know, like the Vermont uh, archaeologists involved and things progress in the future, I mean, there is so much work that can be done up there as far as academically and archaeologically. Uh, you could spend 20, 30 years up there doing stuff. Doing that would be a, a logical step, you know, under, opening that up. Were there children in there? Are there remains? Doing analysis of their bones, yeah. figure out what disease they had. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly that, that, that is something that could, could take place. But we have no we have not found any human remains. Lots of animal bones, but no humans. But, so yes. the fact that they weren't in the no census bones. records, I, I just yeah. find that amazing three three different times. Yeah. Does that mean that the people the local people were covering for them in some way that they weren't uh, letting, letting it be known that there were people up there? Yeah, I believe that was the case. I think for two reasons. First, they had sympathy for them, but they were also afraid for themselves because if oh. they said, you know, we know these guys are up there, then it would be, oh, well, we're going to arrest you too. So there's a lot of fear. In fact, in Rupert, there's a whole, and this is in my book, but there's a whole a guy comes out and says, look, you guys are scared about this, but think of them, what they've been through. He basically pleaded with them to let them, we're not going to let them live here, but let them live there so that they can uh, go on with their lives. So, yeah, that's kind of a beautiful story. Yes? In the two deeds that, where Daniel Shays okay, yes. sold the property, where does the acknowledgement in the deed say he was when he signed that document? Where he was? In the acknowledgement. That's the notary saying, right. I saw Daniel Shays and he was here and he signed. Where yes. does that acknowledgement say he was? Because it should list a town and a county. Sandy, Vermont. Okay. Yeah. Yes? You said that this whole area was logged or has been logged? It has been logged, yes. Continuously over the last? Pretty much, yes. I'm just surprised it hasn't been discovered or more known about it. You know what? And me too. I can't even, I was like, for example, <laughs> the only person that uh, I, I that is, came close to what I've done was back in 19, late 1950s, I came upon a letter, and this guy, he must have lived in Sandgate as a, as, a, as a summer home because he wrote this binder, and it's like an informal history of Sandgate. His name was Hugh Graham, and he was like a historian of Cohoes, New York. So he lived in Cohoes, but then he had some connection to Sandgate. And he was the one who pieced kind of the stuff together, like, oh, there's an old settlement up there, Daniel Shays, and he, part of his quote of that, uh, you know, Village Green and all that came from his research, but then he died in like 1957, and other than, oh yeah, that's Shays Fort, or the postcard, from, that postcard was from, I think, 1900, but no one's done anything up there. I thought for sure someone would have done something, considering its significance, not only just because it's a whole time capsule, of a time period between 1787 and 1815 when people lived there and it's just that. But its connection to that piece of history is, is pretty fascinating. 
Yes. We want to thank you very much for coming and doing this. Wasn't this wonderful? My pleasure. Yeah. That's great. I love For you, we have our Ethan Allen mug and our, our uh, Robert Compton is here someplace Robert, today. Where's Robert? Robert is the mug major. Here's a plug. If you have, if you have a, uh, some kind of a family function, this weekend, my wife had her 50th nursing class reunion, and Robert made mugs with their class picture on them, which were the hit of the weekend. So I suggest you check out. We have his business card on the shelf by the mugs, so check check that out. Okay. And three other quick announcements. Ginger is the person who's responsible for refreshments. For some of you that are regulars, if you have a favorite recipe that you might consider making some donuts, or if you make the uh, donuts, the cookies, or if you make those Rice Krispie squares, that my grandma used to make. There's a clipboard on the table. You can put your name down and a phone number, and Ginger would check with you for a future meeting, a uh, future event here. Two uh, upcoming events. The weekend of October 20th and 21st, we're going to be recognizing the indigenous people of Vermont. And we have some members of the Abnaki Nation and the Siskoi who will be here through the whole weekend, Saturday and Sunday. And they will be doing demonstrations, telling stories, uh, talking about their culture and their art. And on Sunday, the 21st, Fred Wiseman, some of you may know Fred, who's an expert on, on the, the uh, Native Americans of Vermont, will be speaking at 2 o'clock. The title of his talk is The Seeds of Renewal. And he will be sharing his work on ethnobotany. And that's a brand new word to me, ethnobotany, but I think I have an idea of it talk about the agriculture of these peoples, right? So that's on the 21st of October. November 18th, believe it or not, there is a new book out on Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. Maybe you read the review, some of you may have read the review in seven days. The title is Those Turbulent Sons of Freedom, Ethan Allen's Green Mountain Boys and the American Revolution. And the author is uh, Christopher Wren, not to be confused with the architect from the 1600s here, but Christopher Wren is a, sent me a little uh, bio, he was a foreign correspondent for the New York Times for 30 years, he was the chief of the bureau in Moscow, Cairo, Beijing, Ottawa, and Johannesburg, and he's retired to Vermont, he now lives in Thetford and teaches part-time at Dartmouth College. And I believe as, as his, you know, what are you going to do when you retire project? He decided to do a, a biography of Ethan, and he'll be here on the, in November, November 18th. All right, so we uh, try to keep bringing the talks to you. Please keep coming. Thank you for coming today, and get some refreshments on your way out.